Imagine you're doing a whole new paradigm of computing now. Most of the most amazing stuff that actually gets developed or invented using, say, our computers, we don't know what it's going to be yet. This is Xanadu, a Toronto-based company that developed a quantum computer capable of solving a math problem in two minutes that would take the most powerful supercomputers seven million years to figure out. This computer, called Aurora, aims to build on that success. And the really cool thing is, see how they're connected there with the yellow cables? Yeah. They're now talking to each other. No one's done this kind of networking before. So this is about the size of a closet. And once upon a time, this is how big computers were. The conventional ones we use today were about this size. Yes. At least this decade, they won't be the size of our phone. But the end vision for all of us in the industry is to really scale up. The big industries that will be affected will be pharmaceuticals, so drug discovery, material design, quantum chemistry, so like next generation batteries, which is one of Xanadu's uh, key areas we work on. But all the way up to, you know, finance and artificial intelligence, one day will be affected and transformed by this new paradigm of computing. So how does quantum computing actually work? And can it really deliver the advancements so many tech companies promise? Regular computers break information down into a binary code, one or zero. With quantum computers, each piece of information exists at the same time. Instead of one or zero, it's one and zero. That allows for multiple calculations to be made simultaneously. Think about a delivery company that wants to determine the best route from point A to B. A normal computer would process each option individually and then compare the results. Quantum computers can analyze them all almost instantaneously. What we can now do is control matter at the quantum mechanical level. We can take advantage of those rules and engineer our own impossible things. It's really just harnessing this new understanding of nature and being able to do really exciting and useful things with it. Michele Mosca is the co-founder of the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo, the earliest dedicated research center for quantum tech in Canada. We've done a tremendously amazing job at discovering the future in our academic institutions, research labs, even commercializing them. And then we kind of wait and see, and we watch other parts of the world, US, China, and so on, turn them into value-creating technologies, and then we have to import them. The quality of the companies coming out of the Canadian ecosystem are absolutely first rate. Like international investors love what we're producing. We just need to be better at investing them ourselves. Canada is among global leaders in quantum tech. British Columbia-based D-Wave Quantum is considered a pioneer of the industry. But the race is becoming increasingly competitive as new industries in places like India and South Korea emerge. But the stakes of falling behind are greater than you might think. We don't know what the code-breaking capacity of AI together with quantum is going to be. If good people can use it, bad people can weaponize it. In the history of humanity, we've generally waited for the bad thing to happen and then said, oh, we should maybe do something. Now we're in an age of hyperspeed, hyperscale, hyperconcentration. Like, it may not be a recoverable event. I'm trying to catch up and play whack-a-mole. Like, we're losing in cybersecurity. In 2021, Ottawa pledged $360 million as part of Canada's national quantum strategy. Illinois alone invests nearly triple that amount. When you understand how much is needed to really build out the technology, we're very grateful for support from the Canadian government, but we need more. You hear stories about how Canada really grew the talent, but then lost the talent to commercialize. We're in a great position for the Canadian ecosystem. We have some really great companies here, including obviously Xanadu, and we don't want to lose that lead. And so having more government support along with private investment is key for us to really lay claim to a sovereign technology that is really the most powerful anywhere in the world and it's based here in Canada and in our case in Toronto. And producer Michael Hiscock is in studio with us now. Mike, Mike, first of all, I've really enjoyed these deep dives that you've done into the different industries as we are all learning more about our own industries in Canada as we look for other markets. That piece tells us a lot about the stakes in the global quantum race. And I love what Kelly Mosco from U Waterloo said, we are losing in the race of cybersecurity. What does the development of quantum mean for the average person? We understand automotive and farming, but we don't necessarily understand quantum and what it does for us. 
It, so in many ways, it's already here, and it's something you're already feeling. So Samsung, for example, is putting quantum technology in some of its newer TVs to make the colors more vibrant. China is experimenting with it to make its public transit fleet more efficient, so picking up more people with fewer buses while avoiding all the traffic kind of thing. In Canada, we're developing um, quantum-enhanced batteries that can last longer, recharge faster, withstand cold. We're also developing quantum-enhanced radar to um, detect stealth bombers, for example. The kind of holy grail that we're all chasing for the future is what they call a fault-tolerant quantum computer, which is a quantum computer that can be rolled out to the masses. And so this isn't the kind of thing you'll walk into Walmart and buy for your bedroom. It's designed for very high-level computing and questions. Mm -hmm. But you'll feel it once that transition happens through the pace of technological advancement. Suddenly, the healthcare system will be churning out treatments and cures for things it couldn't treat or cure before. We'll have better weather forecasting, better tools to fight climate change. It could potentially go all the way up to helping us put a, a human colony on Mars someday. And is it, it people-driven or is it computer-driven? I'm trying to make like an AI comparison for people. Is it, is it more people jobs or more computer jobs? I would say more, more computer jobs in the... In the probably in the longer term, but in the shorter term, we need people to get it off the ground and running. Okay, well, that's what I want to ask you about. Uh, uh, what did the industry members tell you about what we need to do to stay at the front? And you're aware that we had Minister Evan Solomon on. You know, he tried to spin this uh, this money as we're, we're um, Canada is at the forefront, and we may be at the forefront, but as your piece points out, our Canadian leaders are working for other countries and other companies. Yes, yeah, so we did a really good job of getting in on the ground floor when it came to the quantum race. So if you look at the University of Waterloo, for example, their Institute for Quantum Computing was founded in 2002. So that's wow. when most of us were still using Windows XP and, and, yeah. and dial-up internet. Yeah. Right? But, but a lot's happened since then. And as the, as the competition for quantum has intensified, we've seen Canada's place start to slip a little bit. So we're starting to see a slow migration of our companies south of the border. So D-Wave, which I mentioned in that piece, they relocated their executive office to the United States in 2023. Xanadu merged with a, a US acquisition firm about a month ago. So both of these are still Canadian companies, but they're essentially now joined at the hip with the United States. I see. So we did have D Digital Innovation Minister Evan Solomon on the show yesterday, and he talked a lot about that, that contest, the competition that uh, they've invited quantum tech companies in for, where they receive funding with the goal of developing a quantum computer. That competition doesn't do anything to make itself better than a similar competition the U.S. has already had in place since last year. And so there's a sense in the quantum industry that we're just kind of reaching for the middle and we're not being ambitious enough. Mm. We should remember that in the backdrop of all this, quantum technology is something that we don't yet fully understand and we don't fully realize what it's capable of yet. So if you, if you take a historical example, when the Chinese invented gunpowder in the ninth century, it was supposed to be a form of medicine. It was supposed to be an ingredient, the elixir of immortality. Hmm. The idea to weaponize it came along about 50 to 100 years later, and they started putting it in guns and making fire arrows. So something that was designed to extend lifespans essentially became something that was used to shorten them. Right. And so it just goes to show that with time and exposure, the intended purpose of a technology that we put out into the world can change pretty dramatically. And quantum and AI both have the capability to do immense good, but also immense evil in the world. Okay. And we should fully expect and anticipate that they will be used for both at some point or another. And the best way for us to protect ourselves from that is to stay at the forefront of the technology. Which is what this money is trying to do, but as you say, we're, we are playing a bit of catch up. That's exactly right. Okay. Mike, great to have you on again. Thank you. Uh, we'll be